of Jesus and it's so hard for most people in the world to separate truth which is the Bible from what everybody usually believes okay there are so many false things going around about uh, Easter the death of Jesus on the cross the burial in the grave resurrection uh, the 40 days after the ascension all of there's so much is false and that the world believes because they've been influenced by as I usually say what's that place in California Hollywood, Hollywood. they've been influenced by movies and television and this kind of things even documentaries Doc, just because it says documentary doesn't mean it's true okay and we know that if it's on the internet it's got to be true <laughs> no oh sorry <laughs> I was just testing to see if you're, see if you're awake. And, and, and the stuff on the internet. So all the, you get all this stuff coming in, and people don't even bother to check to see what the Bible says. All right? And this, this week, every year, I start reading and just seeing what people are saying, and I read sermons from other preachers, and I listen to preachers preach about it, and I just gather all kinds of information. I just kind of flood myself with all kinds of stuff. And by the end of the week... My mind is still going in circles from everything I've heard and read. Well, uh, there, is, there is, as I said, there's so much that's not true about this day that we call Easter. I prefer to call it Resurrection Day. Um, you would use it Easter if you want to, that's fine. The word Easter is found in our King James Bible one time, all right? And uh, I'm still not sure how it got there, but God, God knows about that, and it's, it's there, okay? But um, today we're going to study a, a very simple sermon. And I say simple because it really is very simple. Part of this sermon I've given to you before, the first part, and uh, you'll, you'll recognize it right away. I've entitled it The Symbols of Religion. The symbols of religion. Almost every religion, almost, believe it or not, there, there are a couple of religions that don't have a recognized symbol, or at least by them. Everybody else may recognize something that connected with the symbol that connects with them, but the religion itself says, no, we have no recognized symbol. But we, as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, and I don't mean Christians the way the world defines it, I'm talking about the way we define it from the Bible. Uh, we have symbols, we have things that we recognize as standing for uh, who we are, what we believe, or connected with our faith. Well, I'm going to just show you some symbols right now, just very briefly, making sure that's working, uh, that, that connect with a religion or something like that. The Buddhist, uh, Buddhist people have in their religion a symbol. It is a statue of a man, a resemblance of a man called Buddha. 
And there are many, many different styles and types of Buddha statues. Okay? Now, what's that statue called? It's called Buddha. <laughs> right? Now, I don't know what they called it, but that's what we call it. And I don't know a lot about Buddhism. Uh, I know very little, of, actually. I know just enough to get myself in trouble, probably, in a discussion. But they do have a symbol they recognize as uh, their recognized symbol. Uh, did you know that Buddhism and Hinduism share some symbols? Do you see the swastika? Yeah. You thought that came from Hitler, didn't you? Yeah. It did. kids did. He used it, but it didn't come from him. Okay? It comes from Hinduism, and some Buddhists you even use it. But the... Uh, well, I better not, better get off that. Let me just keep going. How's that? <laughs> Shintoism. Shintoism. A uh, very uh, widespread religion in different parts of Asia. And even here in the States. These two posts and beams. They call this the... It's a gate. It actually symbolizes a gate between something that's holy and something that's common or normal and it usually is used as the entrance way into a Buddha or a, a Shinto shrine a holy place for the Shinto people Shinto people Islam say that they don't have a symbol uh, but there are several actually that stand for uh, Islam the heart the the crescent moon is one of the symbols does anybody know why the moon is connected with with uh, uh, Islam? I Some of you should know because I taught you years ago, but you may not have been here then. The what what did you say? What did you say? I said I should know, but I can't remember. You should know. And you will. When I tell you, you're going to say, I remember that. Because um, at the beginning of the school year, I had a presentation of it. But you've forgotten you gave a presentation. You studied and gave a presentation, and now you've forgotten what you did. Yeah, because I, I have to study all these other things so I can get to college. Your mind just can't hold it all, can nope. it? No. <laughs> the moon, The moon has to do with Islam because Mr. Muhammad himself came from a family who worshipped the moon. What was the name of his moon god? Does anybody know? I'm going to say it for you and see if it sounds familiar to you. Allah. How about that? Yes. A female moon god. Allah. Female. When, and when he, before he started his own little religion, and, he, and they ended up being called Islam later, but Mr. Muhammad came from a family, and his family worshipped the moon and other, other planets and other beings and all kinds of things. As a matter of fact, Islam has uh, many representations of gods. How many have heard of the place called Mecca? Yeah. Yeah. Heard of Mecca? Go, if you go to Mecca, which you probably don't want to do, <laughs> not as a non-Muslim, uh, you don't want to go, especially if you want to try to enter into the holy place in Mecca. You don't want to do that. It would be very unsafe for you to do that. But in if you ever look at pictures, look on the internet, and find out about Mecca. There's a black stone there. They say fell from the moon. Okay? This black stone inside of this, this container where this black stone is in the center. You ever seen pictures of the people going around in a circle? Thousands, as many as they can pack in there. And they're cutting themselves and they're praying. Okay? Going through the ritual for Islam. And they're they're going in a circle. I forget which direction they go. Anyway, I think it's counterclockwise, but I can't remember. And they're they're encircling this this black stone and this and inside this representations of hundreds of gods. All different kinds of gods, false gods, idols. Are, are there. Okay? Now, anyway, anyway, 
uh, we recognize some thing, other things as symbols for Islam. They say there is no symbol, but you know, even if there's not, we still, we spot something and say, ah, oh, that stands for Islam, right? We kind of recognize it. How about Mormons? Did you know that Mormons have a symbol? Yes, they do. The Mormon church, uh, as a matter of fact, you see the, you see the angel blowing a horn? That's, that's the symbol for the Mormon TV channel. <laughs> but at, at their library, they have the angel blowing a trumpet. What's that about? Because the angel came down and gave the leader of Mormonism, the founder of Mormonism, gave him golden tablets with the Book of Mormon on it. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Y'all study up on this stuff. It's great entertainment. Really stuff. What's What's this one? What's that? What's that symbol called? Penta. Penta. Pentagram. Pentagram. Five pointed star. Pentagram. Symbol for Satanism. Symbol for Satanism. It's what the Satanists, those who worship Satan and follow Satan. They use this as their symbol and uh, it has to do with it and it, it connects with a lot of other things connected with Satanism all right <coughs> such as witchcraft the Wiccans use very similar symbol uh, I remember a few years ago we we uh, bought some little sheriff's badges that says usher on and I was going to we had some young preteen and teenage ushers in those days helping and these young fellows were helping and I, I got these little sheriff's badges they had five points on them and it said usher on them. to us does it mean anything absolutely not but there was one person in our church saw that and said you can't do that that's from satan this is satan don't do that folks we're not using it as a symbol for satan right. all right? right we're not using it if i see a sheriff's car if a, a, a deputy's car, and they happen to use a five-point star on their as their symbol. It doesn't mean they're Satanists. Right. Let's not be let's not be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Just because something looks similar doesn't mean that's what they're doing. Right. Let's be let's be common. I mean, let's have some common sense about this. But they do recognize this is their symbol. Taoism. You've seen the yin yang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, it's not just a symbol, folks. It's a symbol for their beliefs, their doctrine, which is connected to a whole lot of things. And if I get into it, I'll get sidetracked again. Now, let me show you something else. You see the word Christianity at the top? Yes. Now, this is a picture that I took. My wife knows where this is. This is in Poland where we used to live. Yeah. I took this picture myself. It's on the side of a big Catholic church. This resembles a symbol that we recognize as maybe our symbol. But is our Jesus dead on the cross? No. No. So I don't recognize a crucifixion with a dead Jesus on it as our symbol. Do you? No. No. Absolutely not. Our Jesus is not dead. That's why we celebrate this day every year. Amen. 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 Do you know why else? You know, we celebrate the resurrection every week, whether you know it or not. Every time we meet on Sunday, we're celebrating the resurrection because it's the first day of the week when he came out of the grave. That's why we meet. Amen? Amen. Amen. How about that? Easter every week. Amen. Yeah. Resurrection every week. Another symbol, another similar symbol. Now, there is a group in the world that the world calls Christian, called Catholics, Roman Catholic Church, they recognize this as their symbol. A crucifix, they call it, a cross with a dead Jesus on it. It's not my symbol, and I'm sure it's not yours. Okay. Now, I'm not against using a cross as a symbol. Matter of fact, if you look on top of the building next door, there's a cross up there on the steeple, okay? And uh, by the way, those of you who haven't been here for many years, and some of you have, you know, you know the story behind the, the, the steeple. The steeple's on the other building because that's where the church used to meet. Before this church, before this building was built, the church made over there. That was the church building. And when the church built over here, uh, moved over here to this new building, there was never a, a steeple put up 
How much does a steeple cost? Does anybody know? Does anybody have any idea how much a steeple costs? It's a bunch of bucks. And at times, you have priorities that that are much more important at the time, right? Right. And I think we've got a steeple with a cross on it, and that's fine with me. Amen? Amen. And I'm thankful we have it. Now, does the church have to have a cross on it? No. Did you know a Catholic church has to have a cross on it in order to be a Catholic church? Yes. It's in their dogma. You have to have a cross on that church building, or it's not a church building. How about that? But we don't have to have one. Tom, Tom, he might, he might need something special to make him Tom, but we don't need a cross to make us a church, do we? Amen. That's good. Next time I need help, I know who to call. Amen. <laughs> What's the best symbol for for our Christian faith? The empty tomb. The empty grave. The empty tomb. This is actually a picture of the tomb in Jerusalem that people say Jesus was buried in, and it's possible. I've seen that tomb in person, and it could be where Jesus was buried. It could not be. I don't know. Does it matter? Nope. I just know Jesus is not there. Don't you? Amen. That's all we care about. That's all we care about. Now, different symbols. Different symbols. Why do we say that the cross is our symbol? Why do we say the empty tomb is our symbol? The Bible tells us why. The cross Jesus died on for our sins, that's one of the reasons we use the cross as a symbol for our faith. And we, that we recognize, okay? Before we get into the scripture, I gotta hit something here before I go any further. I don't get to hit this often. Usually once a year I get to talk about this, so let give me just a minute. We as Bible-believing Baptists, okay? We as Bible-believing Baptists, to one degree or another, we observe um, Easter, Resurrection Sunday. But we do not observe Good Friday. Yeah. Why is that? Because Good Friday is a Catholic tradition. It's not biblical. Jesus did not die on Friday. If, all right, if you think he died on Friday, tell me how you get three days and three nights in the grave from Friday to Sunday. I don't care how good your math is or how bad your math is, you can't get it. You can't get three days and three nights. I don't care how you do it. It won't happen. Try it and see if you can do it. You say, well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. You need to understand when the Jewish day started, when the Jewish day ended. Yeah. All right? That'll help you count the days. All right? We go from midnight to midnight, don't we? Mm -hmm. the Jews didn't do that. All right? I've got, I've got all kinds of information I can give you about that, but I'll, I'll save it. If you want some, I've got pages of stuff I can give you. I'll print it out and give it to you that talk, talks about all that. Now, I personally believe that Jesus had to have died on the cross on Wednesday. All right? I really believe that. And then he was taken off the cross and he was buried at the end of the day before sunset on Wednesday. All right? And then you can you have no problem counting, but it's not just the counting, folks. It's the fact that if you go to the calendar, the Jewish calendar, and you go back to when Jesus was living, it fits perfectly that he would have resurrected sometime before daylight, sometime after the Sabbath ended on Saturday night. Between Saturday night and Sunday morning, he resurrected. At what time? I don't know. I don't care. I just know he did. Right. All right? But now, if you say, well, preacher, I'm still going to say Good Friday is the day Jesus died. That's fine with me. That's okay. I, don't, it, I really don't care about that. Care as in it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because as long as you remember that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, he rose from the grave, that's what matters. Amen. Yeah. You mess up your counting if you want to by putting him on the cross on Friday, but and then that's fine. If you want to do that. And if you can show it to me in the Bible, I'll believe it. But it really doesn't matter as far as 
believing that Jesus died for our sins and paid for them on the cross, was buried in the grave, and, and rose on Sunday morning, or before Sunday morning, and, and paid for our sins by death, burial, and resurrection. If you can show me that part, I'll be right there with you. Amen? But it's good to agree with the Bible. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, shows us something about the cross. And this is where I'm, I'm going to pick up my pace now, so hang on. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To the lost people, the pre preaching of the cross is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, you see, being saved is a Bible word. Baptists don't just say, are you saved? Just because we made it up. It comes from the Bible. So though, to unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Preaching of the cross is the power of God. That's what we need to hear more of too. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, begins by saying, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Listen, read that again. That were sometime alienated, that means separated from God, and enemies in your mind by wicked works were all guilty of wicked works. And he said, in your mind. That's where wicked works start. Every sin requires a decision. Well, I didn't mean to sin. Oh, yes, you did. You decided to sin. You made up your mind. You did it. Even if it was just an instant thought, you still decided. It took thought to sin. Amen? Amen. If, it's, if you didn't think about it, then you didn't sin. But that's what God gave us a mind for, to think make decisions with. We made a decision and we chose to sin. Even if it's just an instant, we still made a decision. Okay? We're alienated from God because of it. We're enemies in our mind because of it. Because of our wicked works. Because it starts in our mind. Yet now have he reconciled. God has brought us back through the cross, through the blood of Jesus. Verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You went from being alienated, from separated from God. You went from being an enemy to God to being holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. You didn't get saved by things through this earth. You can't get saved by being baptized. You can't be saved by being good. You can't be saved by giving your money. No, nope. not corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. Conversation means your way of life received by tradition from your fathers. Well, that's just the way I was raised. Can't help it, preacher. It's just the way I was raised. You received it from your fathers and your mothers. Uh, better be careful. I, I, I know people, and you do too, who say, well, I, I, I lose my temper because of my Irish background. I really lose my temper because I'm Italian. Are you American or not? <laughs> I get so tired of people saying, well, I'm Italian, and I'm Greek, and I'm, I'm this. And I'm, are you American or not? Yeah. Right. Amen? Yeah. Well, I'm Irish. I've got Irish blood in me. Maybe way back there. 150 years ago, I had Irish blood in me, but I don't have any left, I don't think. I got American blood now. Amen? Amen. It's like you. Yeah. There's, I, ah, this irritates me. But anyway, we used to have a man to come to church here, and he, he blamed his temper on his, on his Irish background. He said, I've got this terrible temper, and I can't do anything about it. There's nothing I do about it. It's just me because I'm Irish. Then the next week, he can't do anything about his his desire to be out in the wilderness, out in the woods, because his mother was a Cherokee Indian. Anyway, 
We are who we are today because of the decisions we make. That's right. Amen. Every adult here has decided what you're going to be as an adult. Every person here, every teenager, you've decided what you're going to be. You've reached the point where you're making your decisions. Are you going to be close to God? Or are you going to be backslid and wicked? Are you going to be close to God? Live for God? Be holy in your life? Or are you going to be wicked, evil? Uh, um, and that's all I'll say. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Jesus of, of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish, and without spot. That's how we're made close to God. That's how we're made uh, incorruptible in this life. Romans 4, verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Jesus died for our sins, for our offenses, and he was raised so that the job would be finished. Yeah. See, Jesus didn't just die. That If Jesus, if all that happened was he died on the cross and he stayed in the grave, we wouldn't have had a Savior. He arose for our justification. He arose so that our salvation could be complete. Right. Yeah. The resurrection is important. That's why the empty tomb is important. That's why we use the empty tomb as part of a symbol or something we at least connect to as Bible-believing Christians and say, that's what I believe in. That's why I believe in Jesus, because he's not in the grave anymore. Amen. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1. Let's read several verses. I hope you're reading along with me if you can. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher, the grave where Jesus was buried. And behold, there was a great earthquake and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. You think maybe the angel got tired from rolling that stone back she had to sit down? Yeah. You know that angel was a woman with blonde hair, right? No. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. You are. <laughs> everybody, everybody's seen the angels, pictures of angels, right? They had cameras back in those days and took pictures of them. And they, and they all blonde hair, right? And the white skin. Yeah, sure. No. But the angel must have got tired and had to sit on that stone. Yeah. No, of course not. Verse 3. His countenance. The angel is called a his. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> the angel is called a he. A his. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment. White as snow. And for fear of him... The keepers did shake and became as dead men. Does that mean they died? Or does that mean they passed out? They passed out. I don't know. I think they probably just blacked out, don't you? Yeah. Because uh, people die in the presence of God if they look at God face to face. But people don't die from seeing angels. All right? But they sure could pass out. <laughs> Especially a couple of wicked Romans who don't know anything about God and their God is Caesar and all of a sudden here's the angel of the Lord. Whew, man. And his countenance is like lightning. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that would be pretty scary. Verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, to the women, who's the women? Verse 1. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary. Okay. Said to the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Verse 6, my favorite line, isn't it yours? Yes. He is not here, for he is risen, as he, came, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. I love that, don't you? Yes. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, the empty tomb is a great symbol of our faith, isn't it? Amen. It really is. And now, I'm going to do a little trivia thing here, and I'm going to see if anybody can win a prize. I got some prizes in my pocket here. Everybody likes gum, right? 
I don't usually promote chewing gum in church, okay? But I'm gonna have, I've got some gum here, and I'm gonna see if somebody can win some today. Let's see. I'm gonna do a, a Resurrection Day trivia, okay? Uh, let's start with the young ones. If you're under 10 years old, you can take part in this trivia. If you're under 10, if you're, not, if you're under 10, you can answer this, this question. On the morning Jesus arose from the grave, there were three women came to the tomb. Give me the name of one of them. Uh, not three women, two women that's named here. Give me the name of the women who came to the tomb. Mary. What? Mary. 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 Very good. Yes. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Come here, guys. Both of you get. How about that? See, these guys know what they're doing. Don't they? Wait a minute, let me get this open here. Now, I know it's not usually good to give out uh, uh, gum in church, but I like to give out, you know, I like to give prizes. That's, I do like to give prizes, don't I? There's you one, there's you one. There's nothing. What? There's nothing. What do you mean there's nothing? What's wrong with you? There's nothing in here. Is it empty? Yes. Well, now you know how Mary, Mary Magdalene felt. <laughs> they got to the tomb and there was nothing there. They found an empty tomb. So let me have my paper back. Go sit down, guys. Oh. Aren't they good sports? Hey, fellas, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. Because you two were so nice about that, I'll give you an extra treat bag for that. Awesome. Okay? You better I... not be empty next time. <laughs> <laughs> the empty tomb was a surprise to everybody who came, wasn't it? Just like these boys got a surprise. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights, notice the Bible says three days and three nights, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, that's Jesus, be. How long? What's it say? Three, 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 three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How about that? Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The third day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Really love this chapter. I don't know of a bad chapter in the Bible, I'm telling you, but this one here is one of my favorites. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Starts out verse 1 and it says... Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, Paul says to the church at Corinth, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Listen, folks, when you hear the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you don't just receive it, you need to stand on it. Your faith, everything you believe, everything you do in this life, Every day that you live needs to stand on the fact that you're trusting in Jesus who died, was buried, and arose from the grave. That's your foundation. That's what you stand on. Don't forget that. You stand on it. Verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, Paul says, this is how I got saved too, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. Verse 6, after that, he was seen of above 5,000 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Verse 7, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. 
Last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, go up to the end of the chapter, verse 55. Paul says to the church at Corinth, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But verse 57, read it with me, look at it. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is the victory that we all need in our life. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He died on the cross because of our sins. But his resurrection was there as purpose, has a purpose also to finish the job of paying for our salvation. That's our justification. So, Jesus paid the price for our sins. John chapter 14. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Are you trusting in your baptism for your salvation to be complete? You know, this, as a Baptist preacher, I say that a lot in church services and in preaching. I say, you know, we're not saved by being baptized, and it's the truth. But, you know, you might be surprised, you might actually be shocked if you just knew how many people really, truly believe that because they're baptized, they're going to heaven. More than you would think. And they're not just Church of Christ. They're not just Christian Church. They're Mormons. There are Catholics. There are people of different denominations, even Baptists as well, who still believe that because they're baptized, they're going to heaven. So it's not just something I say it's, I'm, I'm combating a false teaching, a false doctrine. I'm fighting against it by reminding you, we're not saved by our, salvation, or by, our, by our baptism. We don't receive salvation because we're baptized. We get baptized because we're saved. Amen. You get saved first, then you get baptized. That brings me to this point. If you've been saved and you have not been baptized yet, you are, now listen to me carefully, I'm going to say this very slowly and clearly. You are living in disobedience to God right now. If you know that you're saved, but you have not submitted to baptism. You listen to me? If you've not been baptized, and you know you need to be, but you choose not to be baptized, you are in disobedience to God's word right now. Does God bless disobedience? No. Never. 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 God does not bless it. As a matter of fact, God takes his blessings away from our lives when we choose to live in disobedience. God pulls his blessings off us when we choose to be disobedient to him. Folks, I care about you, I love you, but we need to make sure we're obedient to God's word. We need to make sure we're obedient. Whatever God's word tells us to do, that's what we need to do. There is only one way to heaven. There is only one way for sins to be forgiven. There's only one way to become a child of God. There's only one way to have peace in your heart as you go through this difficult life that we live. There's only one way. That's by trusting in what Jesus did for us to pay for our sins. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I hope that's what you're believing in. I hope that's what you're trusting in. And I hope that's how you're living your life. Would you just please stand with me? Father, thank you so much for these dear folks. Please take this, this short time that we have right now and work in our hearts. I pray that everybody here would would accept this time as a holy time, a precious time to listen to you, Father, to listen to your Holy Spirit as you speak to our word, speak to our hearts through your word. 
that we will right now choose to obey you. Choose to obey your word. Thank you for these dear friends here in this room with me. But Father, it troubles my heart. It burdens my heart as, the, as pastor and as a preacher and as a fellow Christian to see any believers, young or old, men or women, even boys and girls, who knowingly, willingly choose to disobey you. Know what needs to be done, know how, how to obey you, know what your word says, but refuse to obey it. Lord, it, it, it scares me for anyone who does that. So Father, please work in our hearts. If there's anybody in this room who needs to be saved, dear Father, please show them that they need to do that right now. They need to trust what Jesus did by dying on the cross for us, by being buried in the grave, by resurrecting from the grave three days later. That he did that so that we can have our sins forgiven if we'll come to you, Father, trusting in what Jesus did. If anybody needs to trust you in that way, Father, I pray that you convict their hearts right now. And those who are saved but living in disobedience, whatever it may be, whatever sin, whatever disobedience is there, please work in every heart according to your perfect plan and will for our lives. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for another moment. I need to ask you a question. Is God convicting and working in your heart? Is there sin, Christian? Is there sin there that should not be there? I'm not a Catholic priest. If I were, it wouldn't help you anyway because we don't confess our sins to an earthly man and ask forgiveness that way. God forgives when you ask him yourself. God forgives and cleanses your heart when you come directly to him. Are you willing to do that? You're the one who has to do business with God. I can't do it for you. Will you make your heart right with God by seeking his forgiveness? Or are you going to choose to continue being disobedient? If sin is in your heart, are you willing to say, yes, Lord, Please forgive me. Change my ways. Help me to obey. Has God been speaking to your heart this morning about sin, about being backslid, about being away from God? What's he doing in your life right now? If God's speaking to your heart, you'd like to say, Preacher, would you just pray for me? I know that God's convicting my heart. I know there's something in my life that shouldn't be there. I will not call your name, and I will not embarrass you. But I will, I promise you, I will pray for you every day that God helps you to deal with this in the way he wants you to, that you'll get it right, and God will forgive you. I will be praying in that way. Are you willing to raise your hand right now and say, all you're doing is raising your hand and you're letting me know, preacher, pray for me. There's sin in my life that shouldn't be there. And I know I need to deal with it. Please pray that God helps me with it. Anybody, anybody, all I'm going to do is be praying for you folks. I will not embarrass you. I will not approach you about this. It's between you and God. But I want to be praying for you as your preacher. Amen. Who else? Anybody else? Sin is not anything to play with, folks. Disobedience is not anything to play with. It's something to take very seriously. Are you willing to admit that right now that God's dealing with your heart? I'm going to be praying for you this week. Who else? Amen. Who else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? 
God will not bless this church. God will not bless your home and your family and your life as long as there's sin and disobedience and unwillingness to get it right in your life. God can't bless disobedience. Father, you know the needs of each person here. But I'm so thankful that there are some who've ad admitted by raising their hand, they've acknowledged that they know that your Holy Spirit's dealing with them. And Lord, it doesn't make them any worse or any better than anybody else in this room. But it does show me that they have a tender heart toward you. They want to obey you. But Lord, you know the struggle. You know the temptations. You know the weakness of our flesh. And Father, you know better than anybody because you made us and created us and you work in our hearts every day through your spirit that we need your forgiveness. Please, Father, work in each of these hearts who are willing to acknowledge to you and to me as, a, as their preacher that there's something there that you're dealing with. Whatever it is, Father, please do a mighty work in their life right now. A powerful work that only your spirit can do in their work, in their lives. And help them, Lord, to realize what they need to do to make it right, to seek forgiveness, to go forward for you. I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us in Jesus holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks. God bless you. Miss JJ, you